Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, or good morning to some of you. Thanks for um, joining this industry insight session uh, and the eclectic music beforehand. Thanks so much for that, those of you who are joining us early. This series provides overviews of broad topics that are top of mind for CPG professionals. So let's move on to today's topic. On March 21st, about three weeks ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission proposed a rule change that would require publicly traded companies to include certain climate-related disclosures in their reports. These disclosures would include governance of climate-related risks and how climate-related risks impact company financials and strategy. In addition, the proposed rule would require companies to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions, both direct and indirect. Uh, our first call, uh, many, of, many of you, uh, your first call was to us. Our first call was to our friends at PwC to help us unpack the proposed rule and provide insights on what companies should begin thinking about. Um, so I'm excited today to welcome Julie Bogus, um, partner, ESG Consulting Solutions, PwC US, who will help um, all of you think through what um, companies should begin thinking about in the short term and long term. Julie has more than 21 years of experience helping consumer and industrial products and retail clients undertake ambitious programs to successfully transform their sustainability, finance, IT, risk, and compliance capabilities. She has focused on ESG and sustainability for more than a decade, and her ESG experience includes strategy, value chain impact assessment, materiality assessment, goal setting, training, disclosure, and reporting, and data governance and technology. Um, Julie, I know you've joined us before. Excited to have you with us again today to share your insights. Um, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Ellen. We're, we're very happy to be here, and, and thanks, for, thanks for giving us the, the call. So, um, hi, everyone. Thank you for, for joining. I know this is a definitely the fact that you're here. The, this topic's been on your minds, and it's been an interesting couple of weeks uh, decoding what, what came out from the SEC. My, uh, my work... Uh, with, with with PwC prior to when I started getting involved in sustainability, I uh, actually did a lot of work in the space of helping clients design and implement programs for internal controls and technology to support them for Sarbanes-Oxley in the, the mid 2000s towards the end. So it's been an interesting few weeks seeing, seeing these two things come together. I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Um, I'll, Ellen or Jim, James, you'll let me know if uh, if it's not sharing, but I think it is. Uh, just just to get started here. So, you know, as Alan mentioned, uh, a couple weeks ago, we, we got a lot of information, five, 500 pages of, of information. Uh, but I'll start first with a little bit about, about why. So the SEC has come out with this proposal really in response to the increased or increasing, uh, continuing to increase investor demand around very detailed information about the affects the impacts of climate change on registrants' businesses. And then, of course, more information on how each registrant has addressed and are managing those climate-related risks and, of course, opportunities for, for some companies throughout the way they conduct business, throughout the way they, they set strategies and do financial planning, for, for example. And many of you have already experienced this. Uh, you know, investor demand for information related to climate change isn't new and has been increasing for, for more than a, a decade. Um, and, and this has inspired many of your companies to already be voluntarily disclosing a lot of information around climate risk and impacts. Um, and depending on where your company's headquartered and the other parts of it, you probably also heard about the developments in, in Europe um, as well as other areas more, more broadly. Everything that SEC has in here is um, is consistent with, with some of these other trends we see, and um, you know this is among the SEC's top top priorities. Uh, so I can't say I was expecting uh, 500 pages, but but it's interesting to to finally have it. So really, just to summarize, 500 pages and and, and a few bullet points, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail. But from a level setting perspective, the the proposed rule not not final yet. Um, ask registrants for more information, more information to be provided to investors on the prospective risks and material impacts um, that climate change could should cause on the business, their strategies, their future outlook. Of course, then how uh, the company's governance of those climate related risks and opportunities as well as their, their associated risk management processes. It asks for disclosure around scope one and two greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions 
as well as scope three value chain emissions if they're material or if the registrant has set a reduction target that does include those scope three or a component of their value chain emissions. And then there's a whole host of additional qualitative and quantitative climate risk disclosures that even get into specific line item impacts, financial impacts of climate related events and, and transition activities, how that impacts on specific lines of the financial statements. As noted on this slide, these rules are not final yet. They're open for public com comment. Some of you may be involved with your with your companies and trying to, to answer, to, to file a comment. The SEC has actually asked for input in the proposed rules on over 800 questions. Um, so it's been interesting going through and, and thinking about a response on, on, on our side, as well as talking with clients on how they're thinking about responding or um, you know, using this time period to ask for clarification or, or point out difficulties or challenges with the rules. So that, that's really just the, the initial high level here. Before we get too much farther and, and dig again, I, unless if you're not currently familiar, you might be thinking, okay, when do I need to do this? So what you see here is, is a simplified view that you'll you'll get these slides or you can check out earlier the, the facts sheet that the SEC put out does have a table that, that illustrates the requirement. They've used a, a phased in approach, um, but it also just, it makes a lot of years come into play. So what we tried to do here is focus on large accelerated filers, uh, which I think most of the companies participating today, or at least many of them are. And just to be simple, focus on a calendar year and fiscal year, so 1231. Uh, what, what you see here is, of course, on, on the left, the, the proposal came out. We're in this comment period. So if, you, if your company does want to file, file comments, you have until May 20th uh, to, to do so. And, and it's quite an effort. I wouldn't, if you plan to, to do so, I wouldn't wait um, because just because of the sheer length of the, of the proposal itself, the number of questions. And then you need to have a, quite a bit of um, cross-functional coordination within your company to, to think about how you, you want to pose this response or this, this comment. Um, but then from there, if we take this example of a large accelerated filer with a calendar year and fiscal year, um, what this is trying to show you is that if the rules are finalized within this calendar year, within 2022, so by December 2022, uh, they will be applicable to, to companies, large accelerated filers, as you see here. So in February of 2024, those companies with a calendar year end that are large accelerated filers will file their first climate related disclosures under these new rules, and that includes scope one and scope two metrics. That disclosure filed in February of 2024, of course, is for calendar year, in this case of our calendar year and um, fiscal year end filer. Uh, that disclosure covers a period of 2023. So if you think through it, rules are final, let's say December 2022, starting January of 2023, just the, the next month, that, that's the period that, that will be disclosed in that first filing in, in February of 2024. Part of the phase in period, um, it does include for scope three emissions where they're for those filers for where they're material, those aren't required until the following year. So those would be filed in February, February of 2025. Now, if you're a large accelerated filer that doesn't have a calendar year end, you can kind of mentally shift these dates into the future to whatever month you'll be filing in 2024 and 2025. And if you're not a large accelerated filer, just check out the SEC's fact sheet for more information on when this applies to you. Basically, it's just further out into the future. There is also assurance. Um, we, we didn't show on here. That gets us further out into the, the future. But for large accelerated filers, limited assurance would be required for fiscal year 2024, so those filings in 2025. And then further out into the future, uh, reasonable assurance would be required for fiscal year 2026 filing. So those filed in 2027. So something to think about uh, that that's getting us a little bit further out. But I know one of the things we're consistently talking to clients about is it, it might be tempting to, to wait. It's, it's really tough to, to wait here and, and think about how to get everything you need to get considered done in time. So there, there's a lot to start thinking about even now. Of course, the, the comment period, 
um, as well as just really understanding those areas that will require further interpretation. So how you get involved, what different parts of the company, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of a, a high level playbook or a roadmap or things that you can consider now. But another thing to think about is comparative disclosures. So when you're doing the presentation in future years, the comparative disclosures are required for all of the periods presented unless the, the, the information is not reasonably available. So this will mean because you're providing historical information, just like you do other places in the financial statements um, within the 10K, that you might want to and might need to be disclosing information for 2022 or 2021, even though you're not filing these climate related disclosures till the, the dates you see on the screen. And I guess not to forget, the, the SEC proposal is in response to demand for investors for more information. Many of these the investors are already requesting information and you're already responding. So you'll continue to have those requests and those, those pressures uh, regardless of, of when the rule is in place and where you fall in that phase in period. All right, moving forward. So let's try to di dissect the pieces of the the disclosure requirements a, a little bit more. So there, there's really two parts, and one of them being those that um, apply from Regulation SK. So these are climate-related disclosures. What this will mean, as currently proposed, is a new section of the annual report or registration statement that is entitled climate-related disclosure, so a specific section. Um, the This presentation, uh, the way they, they requested this, is intended to have that that information be disclosed to investors alongside company financial and other non-financial information versus in a separate, let's say, CSR or ESG report. So to get started here, one, one of the topics is the climate-related impacts on the, the company's strategy, business model, and outlook. And the SEC has defined two types of risk, physical risk and transition risk that, that companies need to identify that are reasonably likely to have a material impact and thinking from a short, medium, and long term, and then thinking about how that's considered in your business strategy, your financial planning, the way you allocate capital. So physical risks, probably um, clear to, to many people, but these are risks you can think of often as um, extreme or very severe weather events or natural conditions that occur. So of course, flooding, droughts, um, sea level rise, extreme temperatures, wildfires, and uh, you can think about them in two categories, or you need to think about them in two categories. Some are acute risks, so those are event-driven risks, so a horrible flood that, that strikes a, a geographic area, a hurricane, a, you know, a very specific risk, and then chronic risks, so risks that are definitely relevant to, to the consumer brands association companies, but these are longer term weather patterns, such as um, higher temperatures for a sustained period of time, of course, droughts uh, that can affect the uh, uh, farmland, for example, and uh, water supplies. So definitely factors. So separating out or considering both acute and chronic risks when thinking about physical risk. Uh, this requirement in, in the proposed disclosure requirements does have a, a very detailed requirement. So um, at a zip code level, they're looking for disclosure for assets and operations and areas specifically that are at risk of, of flooding or water stress. The other type of risks are transition risks. So these are risks that companies may face as the, the world faces a transition to a, a lower carbon economy. So, these include things um, that may immediately come in mind, come to mind. Just thinking about um, costs that might be occur due to changes in laws or policy. Uh, of course, customer or consumer preference or behavior changes could could be factors in the future. There could be um, legal or liability risks, perhaps that a company might face, depending on their their um, their product mix. And competitive, um, the impacts of others may be adopting a new technology, or even just general re reputational uh, reputational impacts and risks that, it, of course, are a factor in those consumer or customer um, buying pattern or preferences. So, you might be thinking that there's a lot to think about here, and and there really is, and, and we can't forget that you're thinking both uh, across the short, the medium, and long term. So this this is going to be 
quite challenging for, for companies and some are already doing this and know that this is challenging, but none of us have a crystal ball. So thinking about, for example, an evolving regulatory environment, there, there's a lot of uncertainty. So there, there's a lot to get your arms around here. The next category we have here on the slide for the Regulation SK. So these are, the, again, those disclosures that go in that climate-related disclosure section of the annual report. The, these relate to, uh, you know, as you see here on the screen, is, is the board. What, what's their role in oversight of climate-related risk? What's their experience in, in fulfilling those oversight duties? And then, of course, management's processes for identifying, assessing, managing, um, building climate-related risks and the response to them into the rhythms of the business. If, you're, if you've been involved in the past in your company's TCFD reporting or even the CDP climate change survey response, since it is aligned with the TCFD, some of these categories probably look familiar to you. So it is an area that the, the SEC stated in the, the rule they tried to align with some of the reporting that's already occurring through, through TCFD, the task force on, for on climate related financial disclosures. Um, so hopefully some familiarity to, for, to many, but also very new for, for others. And then a big category here at the bottom. So reporting on greenhouse gas emissions. So the current proposed rules require all companies, regardless of your size, to disclose scope one, direct, these are direct greenhouse gas emissions, and scope two, indirect greenhouse gas emissions. And these will get disclosed in that climate-related disclosure section. Um, the SEC in the proposed rule, is, I think maybe uses the terminology draws upon the, the greenhouse gas protocol. So many of you are already using the greenhouse gas protocol in the disclosures you do voluntarily now through CDP, through your ESG report, TCFD. Um, and it talks, the, the proposed rules talk about the GHG protocol quite, quite a bit. Um, and the, the intent here is to reduce compliance costs, you know, use something that many companies are using, use the vocabulary that, that already ex exists around scope one, scope two, scope three. However, the, the rule does stop short of requiring the use of the greenhouse gas protocol, but it does state that they expect many registrants will. It is important to note that there are some differences from um, the, the accounting methodologies in the GHG protocol and what the SEC is proposing. Um, specifically, one example is around organizational boundaries, which is a key factor in, in measuring GHG emissions. So unlike the GHG protocol, the, the SEC will require registrants to use the same operational boundaries as your consolidated financial statement. So, Said another way, the financial data and the GHG data would be using that same scope for the consolidation and reporting activities that occur to, of course, be consistent for those investors that are using that information, using both the financial and the GHG emissions disclosures. Um, that isn't, not all companies today use the, the same boundary for calculating the greenhouse gas emissions as they do for their financial reporting. So that could definitely result in some changes even for, for your companies that are already um, been, been calculating greenhouse and reporting on greenhouse gas emissions for, for quite some time. Scope three, uh, which is definitely on the mind of, of many of my clients. The, as I mentioned, there is a phase in period to allow companies to get processes and controls and technology in place, in place to support, but Scope three emissions would be required to be reported for companies where they are material or if that registrant has a, a, a reduction target that includes scope three emissions and scope three emissions being the value chain emissions. So think about this as the most common um, material categories for consumer products companies are from the purchased goods and services. So the emissions from, from the supply chain, all of the goods and services that, that you procure. And then depending on the product, there, there could be some um, use phase um, while you're using the project, product. There could be some um, emissions as well as perhaps thinking about the, the end of life. Transportation, of course, is a factor both upstream and downstream as well. So definitely this was an area that, that many were waiting to see if would be included. Um, it was one of the areas that the team putting this together specifically said they were looking at and, and they, they concluded that they determined that Scope three emissions may be material to the, the investor's assessment of, of climate related risk, um, particularly transition risk as we think about the uncertainty in, into the future. 
Um, but this will this will be tough. The you know companies will will need to actually in order to determine if your scope three emissions are material, you probably have to calculate them. Um, and not all companies do that or definitely not across all material um, material categories of scope three emissions. And so this will be very complex. There are modeling techniques you can use that will be allowable, but you're also in many cases relying on information from suppliers and then applying estimates and certain assumptions are around, around your value chain. So even many companies that are already calculating scope three emissions, this will be a, a big effort to, to do so. And then lastly here, we see um, the, the, the SEC is requiring more information than perhaps many expected around transition plans or the, the plans to support any climate related targets or, or goals. And so that is broader than just a GHG emissions target. It could be energy using, usage, water usage. It's asking registrants to disclose the details about your plans to achieve those goals that you have stated, and, and then details around how, it, how it's measured and the time horizon and how you're tracking progress. So, so that's a, a still, you know, deeper level, but still high level of what is being proposed uh, to be disclosed in um, this climate related disclosure. The proposal also includes uh, regulation SX financial statement footnote disclosure that, that probably was more of a surprise to, to many. So in addition to that climate related disclosure and the annual report, there are also requirements to include some disclosures in the notes to the audited financial statements. This is significant because it brings that information under, it will then be subject to management's internal control over financial reporting, often known as SACs, um, as well as audit by the entity's auditor. So complying with the rules here, you, you, see, you see the categories on the screen, the financial impact metrics, expenditure metrics, impact on estimates and, or assumptions. This will require companies to identify whether severe weather events, transition activities, uh, other climate related risk, I guess, and determine at what the impact of these items on an individual financial statement line item. And this, in this case, there is a material materiality threshold. So a threshold of 1% of that impacted line item um, would, would require disclosure. So when we think about financial impact metrics, this, these are things like the impact of the physical risk, those severe weather events like floods or wildfires, but also the impact of any efforts to reduce GHG emissions because you're doing that to mitigate your exposure to, the, to those transition risks. Expenditure metrics, so this, are, this is expenses and capitalized costs to, to mitigate the, the risk, um, as well as ex, mitigate risks of weather events or due to events that actually happened and or exposure to transition risk as well. And then you also need to disclose expenditures and costs related to meeting those targets, those goals and commitments I mentioned earlier. And then lastly here, well, I guess there's also the other information, but the, the impact on estimates and assumptions. So this is an analysis of whether all, you have many estimates and assumptions that are used to produce the financial statements. You're looking at whether those were imp impacted by the exposure to the risk and then uncertainties that you've identified. So one of the difficulties here is companies are not likely capturing information at this level of threshold that will allow this disclosure. That, so, so that's something that needs to be thought about well in advance of how to enhance existing reporting systems around your expenditures, expenses, um, to actually accur accurately capture this information. And to think about a broad range of categories listed in the rule, um, such as you know, our in research and development for new technologies, needs to relocate assets or operations. Uh, so there, there are a whole host of factors that need to be considered. And of course, last year is kind of just other information, the catch all on um, other con contextual information. So shifting gears a, a little bit, you know, you can see uh, across the, the, the top here, it, it isn't six simple steps, but just as companies get started, these are some of the ways uh, we, we see clients and we're, we're helping clients start to think through this. And many of our clients uh, or many companies started in advance of the rule, really, really stepping back and thinking about, okay, we already know 
our investors are using the, the GHG emission and climate risk data that we're disclosing. We want to think about getting it in a more controlled environment that's more along the lines of, of financial reporting, even before the, these required requirements, uh, proposed requirements came out from the SEC. So just to get started, we'll throw a few things at you quickly here today and perhaps have the opportunity to dig into areas of interest in, in the future. But first, stepping back and, and thinking about an overall climate reporting strategy. So taking a look at this proposal, the 500 pages, I'm sorry, um, to, to really evaluate what's being asked for and required. And then thinking about what you're already doing voluntarily. So consider what information and processes you already have um, that you can leverage at a high level to support these, these proposed disclosures from the SEC. So helping you to understand where you are today in terms of the capabilities you have to actually assess climate risks and manage climate risk, as well as collect and report on emissions data and that, that expense uh, data as well, that financial impact data. Clearly a cross-functional team is necessary here. Uh, we typically see representatives from ESG or sustainability or environmental health and safety roles combined with, uh, of course, finance and internal controls, operations, um, IT and technology is very important. We'll talk about in a second to enable, as well as risk and compliance and legal um, internal audit. So really think about who in your company should be at the table to both consider the requirements of the rule and then the company's uh, capacity to respond. And then really you wanna to come together and do this rapid assessment of, of, of the capabilities you'll need in terms of the resources or the people how those people are organized and what processes will be required to comply with the, with the proposed rule or even portions of the proposed rule. If you, you know, do wanna think about perhaps maybe all of it won't come into place during the comment period, we don't know. Um, but many of my clients are kind of prioritizing parts of the rule and, and thinking about where they would get started first, perhaps because it's something you know you need to do anyway regardless, given the fact that you already have investors and many times customers or channel partners uh, requesting this information. Moving on here, choosing standards and, and metrics. So it is important to just step back and think about as a company, align on the standards and the frameworks you're gonna use in, use in reporting. You've heard me mention today that the proposed rules do talk about TCFD and the GHG protocol. So definitely candidates there that, that, that you'll, your cross-functional team, some of your members may be familiar with, but many won't. So think about how you get everyone up to speed on, on what those entail. And then digging in deeper on uh, the, the climate measures that make the most sense or the most relevant for your company in your, the context of, of how you do business and, and then align on those as a team. From there, you want to really dig in and inventory climate-related data, um, both internal and external sources, and develop those processes that you need in place to define the, those key climate metrics and the methodologies you'll use to collect to actually capture that data in a timely manner, and uh, how you could do that to support those standards and metrics. And then do a, do a gap assessment. Think, think about your current disclosures and how they compare to, to what you would deem as SEC-ready. From there, of course, you dig into collecting the data. And again, you may, you may already be, probably are collecting much of this data in some way, but think about how you're gathering it in light of what's in the SEC proposal, making sure you have the data that regulators will expect. Um, and oftentimes this means improving or enhancing the underlying data structures and the processes for how you collect that data. Um, Oftentimes collecting of ESG data doesn't have the same level of robust controls and um, confirmations or certifications throughout the process to ensure that it's complete, accurate, timely. It will be critical to think, think through the GHG metrics and their scope and boundaries, of course, what systems the data come from, who owns the data um, to, to get the, these complete and accurate disclosures that you want to make to, to investors and, and, and obviously to comply with the SEC proposed rules. Uh, I mentioned certification. The last point here, you, 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 may, you already have some form of a certification process for financial reporting. Do you want to use that or parts of it? Or think about a separate certification process to ensure that the company is comfortable with that data. And this all comes with, it's critical to think about what is that accountability and operating model? So who's accountable for each part of the process, data collection, aggregating it, reporting it, 
um, across the organization and ensuring that those roles are clearly defined, communicated, and people are trained. They understand what it means uh, to be a control owner. They understand what it means to be a, a data owner. Um, it is critical. A lot of what I just mentioned actually just is what needs to come together in this framework for controls where you're clearly identifying the controls and the business processes and the IT general control environment that that supports your your disclosures on greenhouse gas emissions and some of the climate other quantitative aspects of the climate related risk and what this may mean is defining um, many of our clients are thinking about, okay, what would SOX level controls look like for the end-to-end -end business processes to support greenhouse gas emissions re reporting? So thinking about from the data source all the way through to the disclosure, what do we need to have in place to ensure the data is um, transparent, traceable? It could be done the next year, repeatable without the same people involved. So what that comes down to is clearly documented information governance standards. Um, documenting what is the actual formula, the calculation to be reformed, the very detailed data sources. Of course, those standards will, will include ensuring that that, that certification process, uh, that ownership and accountability model is followed. In policies, um, of course, you'll have financial reporting policies to comply with the law, but the, the, the regulations as they come out. Um, but this may require changes to operational policies as well. So to ensure that they're aligned with your goals um, as required for the integration of ESG reporting in financial reporting. And again, I, I probably worth repeating, you really need to think about resources. The resources you have to do this today aren't probably the, the ones you'll need in the future. So either new or different people or upskilled people to think about these policies um, and, and procedures that are necessary to support um, rigorous data collection, calculation, and reporting. And then that's where your rollout strategy really comes into play. I think we know from many other initiatives, you might be able to think of some, it's not enough just to have a, a webcast to say, okay, everyone, here's your new rules. Here's how we're gonna do that. Here's the process, take a look. It, it's a continuous upskilling process to really make sure people understand the requirements of their role in collecting complete and accurate data year over year. So it's not kind of a once and done type endeavor. It's something you need to think about the continuous upskilling and particularly as people move through the organization as well. Just a couple other points here from a tech enabled reporting um, pers perspective, really technology is key. And it's one of the, the key ways, not surprisingly, that our clients are thinking about how on earth are we going to aligned with financial reporting timelines. Uh, so oftentimes that is to leverage automation uh, to, to improve the speed with which you can collect and aggregate the, the data. And, but also think about controls. So, you know, so, so technology that will support this non-financial data with the same rigor as financial data uh, for used in financial reporting. So thinking about that traceability, end-to-end -end traceability between source data all the way through to disclosures, of course, auditing controls, um, security controls, data retention, um, ability to audit data. And then I, I mentioned automation. So automation is clearly key for, for speed oftentimes, but also to re reduce the risk of, of, of human error. But you also may need to think about technology and automation, automation to support different dimensions, different cuts of the data. And hopefully this can support some of your actual um, business objectives as well. For example, if you do have targets and it gives you better data to monitor your performance on a more regular basis than perhaps you could in, in the past. Important to note here, it doesn't mean necessarily buying a brand new technology platform that's not currently in your environment. You may have many tools and technologies within your existing architecture that can help you with some of these capabilities. So like, like any endeavor, it's important to step back and think about what are the true requirements you have from technology? What are those capabilities you want to enable around greenhouse gas emissions reporting to, to think about how you do that? And it, again, it could be add-on leveraging tools you already have, and maybe it is new tools in, in your environment as well. Important, this isn't just a standalone technology effort. It's definitely... ESG sustainability professionals working with finance and te technology to think about that financial close timeline. Think about the technology that's already in place to, to help um, to get this done. And then, uh, you know, as you think about the, the steps that you can take to prepare now, 
start start thinking through, you know, how, how will we know? How will we get to the point that our reporting is 10K ready? So really go through the process. Some of our clients are talking about trying to draft uh, the, the climate related disclosures uh, you know, sooner versus later to, to think about what that might require. Uh, another key part, part of this is thinking about uh, assurance um, or attestation. So you, you may already obtain some sort of attestation over your GHG emissions today. The, given the proposed requirements around attestation providers, your, your current provider may work for you, but they, they might also not be um, appropriate given the rules. So it'll be important to take a look at what the rules say around um, what's required of that, that verification or attestation provider. It includes things like whether the provider has a, a license uh, to provide the, such assurance from a licensing or accreditation body, um, if their, their engagements, the way they, they perform the work, their attestation engagements, are they subject to an oversight inspection program? So what you're currently using may work, but you also may think, need to think about making a switch there. And really just the, the last thing I'll note, and then we'll switch over for some questions here, is uh, really some cross-cutting supporting activities. You know, I mentioned assembling a cross-functional team to consider the rules. It's really important if you don't have one already or to revisit what you do have, to think about a cross-functional team for overall accountability for ESG performance. So really think about, do we have the right people at the table um, to, to think broader than GHG emissions, broader than just this rule, to think about the disclosure we do around environmental, social, and, and governance topics and, and, and address any gaps you might have through upskilling or hiring and, and getting the right team in place for an ongoing basis. Similarly, you know, just stepping back and thinking about how these proposed rules might affect your overarching approach to ESG. Many of you already have one, but perhaps it's this is the time to reflect and think about like, is, is what we have in place working? Um, how can we use this regulatory exercise to really continue to enforce our ESG strategy, but create sustainable value for, for the company? Um, hopefully connecting all of your, your different strategies and milestones, and of course, thinking about your, your disclosure requirements. And then lastly here, the board, you know, throughout the, Throughout the proposed rules, you hear a lot about the, the role of the board and the disclosures that will be necessary. Well, you might need the needs to upskill your, your corporate directors to better understand how climate risk and GHG emissions and possibly ESG overall fits into the, the business strategy. Um, so there could be training that, that could be done to, to help uh, the board understand the extent of, of these particular requirements and beyond. And I will, um, you know, I guess, Ellen, perhaps we switch over for, for questions here, um, but uh, just uh, we'll, we'll send this out. But for more information, of course, there's the rule itself. Uh, there is a three page fact, fact sheet that's a lot more digestible. Um, and of course, PwC and, and many other organizations have all sorts of information that will be, be coming out. We've got a new piece that actually I think is really helpful. Um, to companies and uh, explaining some of the more nebulous areas that will be out shortly as well. Thanks, Julie. Um, and um, we've had several people already ping us and ask for the presentation and we've assured them that we can we can um, send that along after today. Um, we, we did have a couple of questions submitted through the chat and also a few submitted ahead of time. So let's get going Great. on those if that's okay. Um, yeah. Folks who still would like to ask a question, please feel free to put one in the chat. Um, here's a question that came through. Would TCFD be enough, or do you also need to look at the greenhouse gas protocol? There, there is alignment between the greenhouse gas protocol and TCFD. So TCFD includes metrics, um, which can be assembled with, with the greenhouse gas protocol. So it, it really is a combination uh, of the two. Okay, thank you. Um, Next question. How does this, I feel like I'm like firing squad with you right now. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. this is all, that's um, what whole thing is like. um, how does this proposed rule build in the guidance the agency issued in 2010? Yeah, so, and, and that will part of, probably be part of what you see come through in some of the comment periods. So many of you know that, that there already has been guidance issued that was also in response to the fact that investors were requesting more and more information on this topic and companies were providing it to really that guidance emphasizes that 
you need to be thinking about climate risk in the existing disclosure requirements. So the things like the description of the business, the risk factors, um, the, the MDNA, the management discussion and analysis. It, this obviously goes well well beyond that, creating a new section, but it, it doesn't replace that at this point. So every company should continue to be conscious of their obligations under that guidance. And then more recently in the fall, the, the SEC issued comment letters requesting more information on disclosures in, in light of that guidance and topical areas that they, uh, the, the, the sample letter and therefore many of the companies included things such as, you're, you're describing more, you've got more expansive disclosure in your sustainability report or your ESG report than you put in your SEC filing. So can you tell us about what consideration um, you made about not putting that over there, you know, about not giving that same level of, uh, of, of disclosure to, on climate related issues in your SEC filings. Of course, talking about um, within the risk factors, uh, you know, did you tell us about how you adequately considered the, and of course, materiality is factor here, but the material effects of transition risks, and then thinking about that management discussion and analysis, thinking about, um, asking about material expenditures for, for, for climate related projects, um, material indirect consequences of climate change and, and uh, thinking about just general identification of will there have there been, will there be developments and legislation or regulation that, that weren't discussed in your filing? All right. Um... Lots of people asking for some free advice here today, Julie. Here's one. Do we expect a lot of estimation in place for things like scope three GHG emissions and the impact of climate related events on respective FS line items? Seems this will be difficult to audit. Thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know you're you're hit, hitting on two of the the probably you know most difficult and the most to figure out um, pieces of it. So the financial reporting already has estimates and, and assumptions in it, but scope three absolutely will be an area that does require uh, estimates. Uh, of course, uh, hopefully as time evolves along with some actual data, but some estimates and, and assumptions. The, those line item disclosures, yes, the, there's a lot that, that goes into, uh, there, there's gonna be, there's a lot to be figured out. So that wasn't necessarily um, an area I think that anyone expected um, in, in advance of the rules. So I, I think, I don't have a crystal ball either, but get, dig, getting into the details of, of how to figure that out will be a big part of this, um, the period even pre the rule. And then of course, after it's, it's final. Perfect. Um, Another question, what if any intersection exists between TCFD and SASB? Um, so, so there's certainly some intersection depending on the sector. So, so, so the SASB standards are um, on a industry-industry basis, I think 77 standards of um, topics that are likely material to companies in, the, in that industry. It's broader than climate-related disclosure, so financial disclosure. So, Depending on the industry, if the SASB standards have identified climate risk or GHG emissions as material, there'll be overlap there. And, and there's a number of initiatives, and there'll be even more to come about trying to align. So, you know, one is it referring to a different greenhouse gas protocol is kind of where where the different standards have narrowed in on referring to, but the, there's some 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 difficulties or challenges there as well. Yeah, in terms of now thinking about using the greenhouse gas protocol and, and financial reporting, that wasn't necessarily what it was originally written for, and might require some updates. Okay. Um, if you've got, I know this is supposed to end right now, but if you've got a couple other minutes, we've got yeah. a couple other questions. Okay. Um, based on about 800 questions, where SEC is looking for input. Any qualitative sense for areas SEC may be willing to move or modify significantly versus what is likely locked? No, I don't have any specific insight. It's been interesting for me. So I, I'm part of our cross-functional team of, of people who do this for a living of, of actually, you know, anytime the SEC comes out with something for comment, that's what they do. And then I'm there from, you know, my, my support and work with clients in the field on these, these topics. And, and so I have, I've asked a lot of questions about, well, do you think they, this is very unclear. It seems like they were expecting, I guess, to get a lot of comments. And I guess that that can be the case. They'll use some of these comments to massage things or 
I, and it, it's hard to, it, it, different topics could go either way. They, they've mentioned, you know, some, maybe the, some of the areas where they've left it up to company discretion, maybe based on the comments, they'll say, okay, well, because of the comments, we're actually going to require this specific aspect. It's no longer an if, it's a requirement. In other areas, perhaps that they will lessen. So no, unfortunately, I, I can't identify any particular areas. But in terms of planning your efforts, because there is a, just a ton um, with, within the disclosure, on a company by company basis, I definitely would step back and think about, okay, for example, gr greenhouse gas emissions disclosure, you may already be doing that. If you're not, you probably have customers or investors that are asking for it. Um, that's kind of a no regrets move in, in improving the, your abilities to, to calculate, you know, collect and calculate and aggregate that. Some of the others that are more far-fetched also have a, a, or more of something you're not doing today. It probably will take you longer to, to figure it out. So you might want to have a different group of people starting to think about it, but you might also have a bucket that um, of the requirements where you say, okay, let's take a wait and see approach. But mm -hmm. again, as a public company, you already do have some disclosure requirements around climate related risk. So contemplating how you, you know, maybe enhance those processes along the lines of what's uh, you're, you're doing what you need to do for today, but maybe you're using some of what was in the role to enhance that um, starting now. Got it. Um, all right, one last question, and then we'll wrap this up. This is, a, I think, a good segue from what you were just talking about. This question is, do you anticipate any guidance for what is considered climate-related or not, i.e. assume all severe weather is climate-related? Um, how would you answer that question? Yeah, I th they, they tried to, I think, sidestep's not the right word, but it's what, what just came to mind, by by defining climate related risk specifically as physical and transition um, to, to say this is explicitly, these are the items. It's the physical risk, which include the weather and then the transition risk um, to, to try to get around defining what is, what is climate related. Of course, there probably could be some gray area um, as well, but I think there, that was definitely an attempt by having the specific categories uh, of physical and transition risk to, to be clear there and explicitly define it. Great, got it, thank you. All right, Julie, thank you for joining us today and to PwC for their continued support of the Consumer Brands Association. We look forward to sharing additional insights from PwC at, during future sessions and, and in other initiatives. Uh, I think the big takeaway today is, as Julie so eloquently kind of shared over the last 45 minutes or so is that CPG companies have a lot to think about. Um, and um, certainly the insights from PwC hopefully helped add some clarity today and during, during what is a, a really tricky topic. Um, we will continue to monitor the situation as it evolves during comment periods. And Julie, if we, if we are so inclined, hopefully you'll be willing to come, up, come in again and give us an update for folks who um, found value in what you shared today. So. Uh, absolutely, we'll, we'll be learning a lot more you know, every, every week. So there should always be a, a lot to share. <laughs> no kidding. All right, thanks for everybody for joining today's session. Uh, please keep an eye on the Consumer Brands website for future educational opportunities. And we'll be sure to get those slides over um, when they are finished and approved. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Bye.